On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including the ISS dodging some Soviet debris, South Korea preparing a second launch for their first rocket, SpaceX launching three Falcons in 36 hours, NASA selects astronauts for first crewed Starliner flights, and scientists are excited to discover an ultra-rare star. There's lots to go over this week, so let's get going. This is the Space Race. Roscosmos, the Russian space agency, was forced to maneuver the ISS away from satellite debris using the uncrewed Progress 81 cargo vehicle's engines to nudge the station out of the path of the oncoming fragments. Dmitry Rogozin of Roscosmos reported that at 22.03 Moscow time, the engines of the Russian Progress MS-20 transport cargo ship carried out an unscheduled maneuver to avoid a dangerous approach of the International Space Station with a fragment of the Cosmos 1408 spacecraft. The Cosmos 1408 was an old Soviet electronic and signals intelligence-focused Selena D satellite and was launched in 1982. It was destroyed on November 15, 2021, as part of a Russian anti-satellite weapons test. At the time, US military and NASA officials condemned Russia for the reckless test, which they rightly predicted could put the ISS and other orbital platforms at risk. Just hours later, astronauts were forced to take shelter in their return vehicles as the debris passed uncomfortably close several times. Space agencies around the world keep a very close eye on debris, so the trajectory of the Cosmos 1408 debris was known, and while the four and a half minute long burn to move the station was unplanned, NASA said there was never any cause to be alarmed. The NASA update says that there was no impact on the station operations and without the maneuver, the fragment was predicted to pass within a half mile of the station. Still, it's better safe than sorry, especially when there's the potential to reenact the Kessler syndrome scene from gravity. We're all glad the station was pushed to a higher orbit as a precaution. This is another stark reminder that it's getting awfully crowded in low Earth orbit. Plenty of debris from the early space race and ongoing efforts are threatening our launches and lower orbiting platforms. The slew of new tech designed to deal with floating scrap is another indication that it's getting to be a problem too big to ignore. In a year already filled with SpaceX milestones, the rocket company has reached an impressive benchmark last weekend, as over the course of Friday the 17th to Sunday the 19th, three Falcon 9 rockets delivered payloads to orbit within the span of about 36 hours. The launches, which set a record for shortest span between three missions for a commercial rocket company, lifted off from both Cape Canaveral in Florida and Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. With these missions, SpaceX is on track to surpass last year's 31 launches by the end of July. The rocket company is aiming to launch over 50 Falcon 9s this year, in addition to any testing of their Super Heavy and Starship. The first launch in the mission lineup was flown from the Kennedy Space Center on Friday and delivered a batch of Starlink satellites. The second flight launched Saturday and delivered a German military reconnaissance platform, but the third flight on Sunday was a little odd. The mission was to take a relatively small Global Star satellite and release it into orbit, but SpaceX and Globestar were both acting a little secretive. First off, the live webcast didn't show onboard camera views until an hour into the mission, which is definitely not usual for SpaceX. When they did turn the cameras on, the Globestar FM15 satellite was seen mounted to a structure in the upper stage that looked like it was designed to have room for other payloads. It's a little sus. In addition to that, the Falcon 9 booster should have had enough fuel to land back on the pad, but instead had to land at sea on the drone ship. Seems like it was lifting more weight than it should have been. Finally, Globestar is being pretty tight-lipped about the whole operation. The company, which already operates a fleet of communication satellites, didn't publicize the launch in advance, and the FM-15 is part of a $317 million contract 
that has a total of 17 S-band satellites for an unnamed customer. That's certainly a little spooky, but what's a historic milestone without some things to speculate on? Will SpaceX hit their 50 Falcon 9 launch target? What do you think was in the last launch? Let us know in the comments below. In more good news for rocketry fans, South Korea has announced that their first ever domestically built rocket will be ready for its second launch attempt on June 21st. The rocket was originally scheduled for a June 15th launch, but was forced to delay due to strong winds, and then delayed again when engineers discovered an issue with a level sensor in the oxidizer tank that required the whole thing to be brought back to the hangar for repairs. The Korea Aerospace Research Institute, or CARI, reported that the malfunctioning sensor was relaying static information while the tank was being filled, and after replacing the part, no further issues were detected. For now, the new launch date is tentative and subject to change depending on the weather, with the Narrow Space Center predicting it to be rainy at the very least. The first launch of KSL V2 in October last year went mostly according to plan until the third stage shut off prematurely and dropped the dummy payload back to Earth before reaching orbital speeds. It was later found that an improperly secured helium tank was likely the issue. While the first attempt was a bust, Carey must have faith in this launch because the KSL V2 is attempting to carry not just a 180 kilogram test satellite, but also four smaller sats made by local universities. The KSL V2 is a kerosene and liquid oxygen fueled three stage rocket powered by four KRE 075 engines in the first stage booster and another one on the second stage. The third stage has a smaller KRE-007 engine for maneuvering in orbit, with the independent commercial launches and with other countries like China investing in launches and facilities, we're starting to see a great trend of more and more folks getting into rocketry. It feels like the start of something bigger, a toe in the proverbial water that is cislunar space. Best of luck to our Korean friends as they prepare to make another attempt to reach the stars. On Friday the 17th, NASA announced the two astronauts who will take the leap and pilot Boeing Starliner capsule for its first crewed mission later this summer. Following the successful Orbital Flight Test 2 in May, NASA cleared the Starliner for a crewed launch attempt. Looking ahead to the as yet unscheduled launch, NASA has assigned astronauts Sonny Williams and Butch Wilmore both of whom are veterans to orbital operations, which is good because Starliner has had no shortage of issues on the road to this milestone. Orbital Flight Test 1 had a software malfunction that stopped it from docking with the ISS, and Orbital Flight Test 2 had several delays while Boeing engineers patched glitches and fixed equipment. And after all of that, there were still complications. During OFT2, Starliner had engines cut out and had to reboot a docking program before finally maneuvering in for the final lock on the ISS. Which is probably why NASA chose Williams and Wilmore. Wilmore spent six months on the ISS in 2014 and 2015, and Williams, who will be piloting the capsule, served in two long duration missions to the ISS in the past. It's clear NASA wants to nail this test. The $4.3 billion contract with Boeing has already been so plagued with issues that even if the crewed flight test is successful, Starliner is not going to see much use before the space station's end of life. However, Boeing flight teams have shown themselves to be capable under pressure, so there's not a whole lot of risk to the crew for this mission, and NASA says the date of CFT-1 should be announced by the end of July, likely giving Boeing some time to thoroughly inspect and test their crewed capsule. With any luck, Starliner will be cleared for long-term crewed missions soon after that, and Dragon can give its back a much-needed rest. Astronomers have just discovered an outstandingly rare type of star right here in our own galaxy. Maxi J181695 is roughly 30,000 light years away, and it was only recently discovered. Its X-ray emanations were discovered on June 7th and hinted at its possible identity. 
From the data gathered, astronomers believe this star is an accreting X-ray millisecond pulsar, a stellar phenomenon so rare we only know of 18 in total. Sometimes when a star dies, it goes supernova and then collapses into a tiny core. These things are dense, like about 2.2 times the mass of our sun packed into a 20 kilometer diameter sphere sort of dense. And even rarer than that, sometimes those neutron stars start to pulse, becoming pulsars. There's only two types of pulsars that we know of, ones powered by rotation, and then the much rarer ones, the ones powered by accretion. You know those images of black holes we see all the time? Well, the bright parts we can see are called accretion disks, and they're filled with the material that a black hole eats. So an accreting pulsar is powered by, you guessed it, eating other stars. These pulsars are in binary systems, feeding off their companion stars and blasting radiation into space at regular intervals. That is usually how we find pulsars too. Their radiation blink passes us like a lighthouse beam. And judging from the data, our new pulsar is rotating at a staggering 528.6 times per second, hence the millisecond pulsar moniker. This discovery is new and in a spot where we hadn't detected any stars before, which is not too out of the ordinary for a giant rotating galaxy, but now that our attention is there, efforts are ongoing to see if we can spot the poor companion star that this pulsar is siphoning stellar mass from. Pulsars are one of those stellar phenomena that are both terrifying and interesting at the same time. Any of you folks feel the same way? Let us know in the comments below. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.